On behalf of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, I am happy to welcome you to this briefing, Green Infrastructure, a Blueprint for Climate Resilient Communities. I'm Ellen Vaughn, and for those of you who don't know us, uh, EESI has been bringing briefings like this to Capitol Hill for about 35 years now. Uh, EESI was formed from a Congressional Environmental and Energy Caucus and became an independent nonprofit uh, organization that continues to bring facts and science to the policymaking process. I have the honor of introducing our expert panel today, but first I would like to thank Congressman Cartwright for sponsoring this event and also to the American Society of Landscape Architects for supporting and partnering with us on today's briefing. As this Congress and many of you consider legislative proposals over the next two years, we think you'll agree that infrastructure repair and modernization and resilience to extreme weather are critical issues. The 115th Congress made some terrific progress on this front. There was the Disaster Reform, uh, Recover, Disaster Recovery Reform Act, um, National Defense Authorization Act, Water Development Resources Act. These all had resilience provisions, uh, which are terrific. But there's, they left plenty more to do. So in a series of briefings and materials, over the next two years, EESI will take a look at the implementation of these new laws and other important matters such as reauthorizing, reforming the National Flood Insurance Program, um, and looking at public infrastructure funding and financing mechanisms. Today's discussion about green infrastructure is essential as we look for solutions to address climate change and its impacts. The fourth National Climate Assessment cites the ominous but real threats of more frequent and longer lasting power outages, fuel shortages, and impacts on critical systems, and also health and safety impacts. It reports that infrastructure currently designed for historical climate conditions is more vulnerable to future weather extremes and climate change, and that coastal communities and the ecosystems that support them are increasingly threatened, and underserved communities are the most vulnerable. But the report also offers hope. More than half of the damages to coastal property are estimated to be avoidable through well-timed uh, adaptation measures, it says, such as shoreline protection and conservation of coastal ecosystems. And forward-looking infrastructure design, planning, and operational measures and standards can reduce exposure and vulnerability to the impacts of climate change and reduce energy use while providing additional near-term benefits, such as reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So our panel today will discuss how green infrastructure is already making a positive impact and can do even more. ASLA's interdisciplinary Blue Ribbon Panel on Climate Change and Resilience identified core principles and public policies that will promote healthy, climate-smart, and resilient communities. And this is the report, which you saw out there. We are delighted to have four of the Blue Ribbon panelists here with us today. So I am very happy to introduce um, our first panelists, and let me say also that if you could hold your questions, I hope you will ask questions and remember them, but if you could hold them till the end, we'll, I'll introduce each panelist individually, and then we'll have um, 30 minutes at, at the end of the presentations for Q&A. So our first panelist is Nancy Somerville. And Nancy is the Executive Vice President and CEO of American Society of Landscape Architects. Since joining the Society in August 2000, she has expanded ASLA's public relations programs, increased their presence on Capitol Hill, and in district and regional policy forums, and enabled the Society to become a more effective advocate on 
transportation, green infrastructure, and other environmental and land use issues. Nancy initiated the ASLA headquarters green roof demonstration project and directs the society's ongoing green roof and green infrastructure education and advocacy programs. She also directs ASLA's participation as a founding partner in the Sustainable Sites Initiative. So it is my pleasure to welcome Nancy Somerville. Thank you, Ellen, and thanks to your entire team at EESI for partnering with us and uh, doing such a fabulous job getting this together. We really appreciate that. And I also want to add my thanks also to Congressman Matt Cartwright and his staff for assisting with this briefing uh, and for all of the leadership that he has shown, his support on legislation um, such as those that address the public health impacts of climate change, create energy efficient schools, encourage transit use, and of course promote green infrastructure, um, among others. Uh, so first a little bit about ASLA. Uh, the American Society of Landscape Architects was founded in 1899. We are the professional association in the U.S. for landscape architects. We have over 15,000 members who practice across the country and abroad. Landscape architects lead the planning, design, and stewardship of healthy, equitable, safe, and resilient communities. Since uh, sustainability, um, what we used to call stewardship of the land, has been part of the society's mission um, since its founding and continues to inform all of our programs and our operations. We have been a leader in demonstrating the benefits of green infrastructure and resilient development practices through the creation of our own green roof. Um, over at 636 I Street Northwest. You're welcome to come and visit. Um, Co-development of the Sustainable Sites Initiative rating system and creation of many publicly accessible sustainable design resources. Landscape architects recognize that climate change is intensifying the negative impacts of standard development practices and putting our people and our communities at risk. We need a new paradigm for how we are building resilient communities that works in tandem with natural systems and considers the needs of all. To meet that goal, ASLA convened an interdisciplinary blue ribbon panel on climate change and resilience. Uh, the panel uh, included landscape architects, of course, other designers, engineers, environmental scientists, and public policy makers. The panel identified core principles key planning and design strategies, and public policies that will promote healthy, climate-smart, and resilient communities. First, the panel identified core principles that provide a basis for public policies that support resilience. These emphasize meaningful community engagement, a special focus on vulnerable communities, and a regional approach based on landscape ecology, since watersheds and other ecosystems do not recognize political boundaries. The design and planning strategies identified by the panel fall into five categories. Natural systems, community development, vulnerable communities, transportation, and agriculture. Our briefing today focuses on natural systems and the primary recommendation in that category, green infrastructure. Many of the problems that we are facing, flooding, urban heat island, air and water pollution, coastal erosion, groundwater related subsidence, these are the direct results of ignoring or trying to engineer our way around natural systems. In other words, paving the planet really wasn't a very good idea. <laughs> the better approach is to design in concert with natural systems and to protect and maximize the multiple benefits provided by those systems. That's what green infrastructure is about. In urban and suburban settings, green infrastructure key strategies that should be applied to all development and reconstruction are reducing paved areas, using porous pavements and incorporating trees and vegetation, green roofs and cisterns for capture and reuse of stormwater, use of biohabitat supporting and pollinator friendly plant species appropriate to the region and to changing climate conditions maximizing the green infrastructure capabilities of community parks and open spaces, and increased tree canopy. Green infrastructure, in, green infrastructure strategies outside urban corridors include protection and expansion of open space and natural <coughs> systems, including wetlands and other important buffers along coasts and inland waterways. 
preservation of wildlands and biohabitat, protection of critical water sources, including aquifers, and greenways and wildlife corridors to, to provide uh, and support animal and plant migration. The beauty of these nature-based green infrastructure strategies is that they come with multiple benefits. Uh, some communities have embraced green infrastructure um, because they're looking to manage stormwater. Um, some communities have embraced green infrastructure because they're looking to reduce the urban heat island. Um, whatever the reason that they're going in, um, the beauty of it is they get all of the other benefits that come along with them. Um, when you factor in all of those benefits, you get a tremendous return on investment for your investments in green infrastructure. Our Blue Ribbon Panel also identified some specific public policies to promote green infrastructure. These include providing dedicated funding and providing incentives for infiltrating precipitation on site, using pollinator-friendly vegetation, and protecting green space. The report also calls for a national and suburban tree planting strategy and tree canopy goals. Finally, I want to mention some uh, key legislation. First, the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act. After many years of ASLA and landscape architects educating policymakers about the effectiveness and value of using green infrastructure to address water and stormwater management issues, Congress passed and the President signed into law the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act on January 14th. Sponsored and championed by Congressman Bob Gibbs and Senator Deb Fisher, this new law promotes the use of green infrastructure in municipal planning for stormwater and wastewater management projects. The measure also calls on the EPA to provide research, data, and technical assistance to help communities implement green infrastructure projects. Passage of this bill was an important win for ASLA and, frankly, for communities across the country. I also want to applaud Congress for recently passing legislation to permanently authorize the Land and Water Conservation Fund. This legislation was overwhelmingly passed by both the House and Senate and is now ready for the President's signature. LWCF, I think as many of you know, is the premier federal program to protect our nation's natural and cultural resources, including public lands and waters, and to create local community parks and recreational facilities. ASLA members across access LWCF funds to plan and design community park and recreation projects across the country. And as noted earlier, Parks and other green spaces also serve as natural sponges, soaking up rainwater, providing flood control, and helping to recharge groundwater, all increasingly important as we see the effects of climate change. And finally, the Living Shorelines Act. Our coastal communities have always been at risk at storms, but climate change has increased the intensity and frequency of weather-related events, leaving many coastal communities and their residents in peril. To address the unique vulnerabilities of coastal communities, Congressman Frank Pallone introduced legislation last con Congress that would promote the use of green infrastructure and other natural uh, solutions to better protect these critical uh, and vulnerable areas. The bill would promote the use of living or natural infrastructure, such as seagrasses, mussel and oyster beds, and other nature-based solutions along our coasts and inland waterways. This legislation would also help communities to monitor projects and collect data on the efficiencies of these green and nature-based infrastructure solutions. Uh, we were a champion for this important measure, and we will continue our support with, when Congressman Marie Pallone reintroduces the bill during this current Congress. Oh, and I, last, that was not last, but last but not really last, but not least in the legislation, environmental justice. Uh, ASLA firmly believes that all communities, all communities, are entitled to fair treatment, treatment and meaningful involvement of their citizens when making decisions impacting the built and the natural environment. ASLA supports legislation that calls on our federal agencies to address these environmental justice tenets and looks forward to Congress reintroducing environmental legislation this Congress. Thank you, and I will hand it back to Ellen Vaughn.
<clears throat> this is a challenge. Thank you, Nancy. I think the trick is to not stand over it. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I would uh, like to just segue right into our next uh, speaker. Be sure to keep your questions for Nancy until the end. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Dawson. Mark is a landscape architect and managing principal at Sasaki Associates, an international interdisciplinary planning and design firm. Mark views the cities in which he lives and works as vital and dynamic ecosystems. Synthesizing the complexities of social, economic, environmental, and cultural influences, he's able to create coherent, enduring, sustainable civic designs. Mark speaks to communities about the importance of planning and designing for resiliency and how their voice in the process ens ensures dialogue and uh, contribution, environmental stewardship, and lasting positive contribution to their communities. Mark, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Ellen. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mark. Um, really excited to share with you um, some of the things and trends that we've seen in the last 40, I've seen in the last 38 years of my practice. I think as a landscape architect, we were trained, I think we were trained in a, in a manner that was always about designing uh, with nature. And, and that's not a cliche. There's a tremendous book that it sort of inspired me as a young landscape architect by Ian McCard called Designing with Nature, which um, talks about durability and resiliency. Uh, and he wrote that book in the uh, late 60s. So it's not a new phenomenon that we're talking here about resiliency. Um, you know, I think some of the things that continue to, to f face us, we, our organization uh, is is, uh, you know, has one foot in academia and the other in practice. And that's a really interesting seam to, to be on because we, we uh, support um, research. And one of the research projects we took on seven years ago was, was looking at um, Boston and the waterfront and, and the whole conversation was starting to percolate around sea level rise. And we sort of did a analytic on that and, and looked at what, what impact would happen to sea level rise in Boston. And, you know, over the years, you know, we have king tides, we have, you know, lunar tides, we have wind conditions that make the, the coastline, uh, the harbor itself fluctuate quite a bit. And it's not uncommon to see uh, seawater breaching the sea walls a, around Boston. That's not an uncommon occurrence. But I think what we, we did as part of our little research project was sort of try to map what we could ascertain from science about the impacts of sea, sea level rise and what would that be over a period of time uh, looking out uh, roughly 80 years. But it's not just sea level rise, really. It's the risk of flood completely increasing, and we see that not, not only on the coastal areas where we work, but certainly on riverine environments and in uh, urban centers. Uh, there's a continuation of these sort of extreme temperatures that are happening, whether it's cold or whether it's hot. Uh, they seem to be increasing. And we had a phenomenon in Boston earlier in November where we had temperatures that I don't remember ever being, you know, down in the single digits in November quite that early. But it happened. And it seems to be happening to more regular and frequent occurrence. This map that I'm going to show you now is really kind of a build, right? So we're talking about, um, you know, in 2030 to 2050, some of the impacts of what sea level rise would happen in the downtown core of Boston on its waterfront. And you can see sort of blue, this kind of blue shading. This map builds. So then you see what happens if those sea level rises increases from 9 inches to 21 inches. And then what happens if it exceeds that 21 inches and looks to be perhaps 30 inches? 
what was really interesting was um, we were asked to then exhibit our research at the district hall in the kind of new development area of the city of Boston in the Seaport District. And so we put our boards in and of course, you know, just we're, we're interested in um, conveying things graphically so people can touch them. Well, I got a call right before this opened from the mayor's chief of staff saying, remove that blue tape on that riser. Uh, because eight years ago, the Seaport District was beginning to redevelop and just gaining its momentum and steam. And there were developers and investment interests who were coming to this meeting to talk about this issue. And the chief of staff hung up on me. He said, take it off. So we did, of course. <laughs> we did. We didn't want to jeopardize the economic future of the Seaport District. Uh, but, the, but the point was, we were trying to stimulate the conversation. And it certainly did that. <laughs> um, so, again, in our practice, we work all over the country and all over the world, and, and I've spent 20 years working in Cincinnati on the Ohio River. You know, this is a riverine environment, but it's controlled, so we know when the flood's coming. They can tell you how much water they're going to release downriver. Um, so when we design these landscapes, because they're really sexy, right, people want to get to the water, right? They want to touch the water. Um, and I think that that they, we allow them to do that. But we, of course, in our analytical manner, studied the flood impacts and basically the park we were designing, we recognized was gonna be underwater every year in some form or another. That's not really true. Sometimes the floods don't come, but you'll get more extreme floods more frequently than we've ever seen. So in that design process, we really had to um, look at the, the improvements we were making and, and the pretty, pretty intensive capital improvements and how do you make those durable? What do you do to protect that investment for the community? This was the flood in, in uh, 2018. And these are, you know, just what happens to your design work, what happens to people's parks. But what we did do in the process was design things like in this middle, this middle image of this slide is a restroom block that we designed to be able to be moved out when it was going to be a 10-year flood or greater. And, and so the, the, the Parks Department mobilizes its team, and they have, you know, particular levels to come in, and they, they remove anything that they feel could be impacted. And, and we didn't just scatter those anonymously. It was a long discussion about where those, those um, improvements were made. Uh, places like the Chicago Riverwalk, um, a more recent uh, um, effort, um, you know, is, is rediscovering the Chicago River. I mean, it was completely undervalued and uh, underappreciated and inaccessible. Um, but Mayor Ron Emanuel uh, had, had the, the foresight and we were, had the opportunity to design that. And, and wouldn't you know, the day before opening, literally, it looked like this uh, right side of this image that you're looking at. It was underwater. I had the, the uh, project manager call me and say, what are we going to do? I said, well, we designed it so that the water recedes and it takes any, any filtration through it. And so again, it's about designing for durability. And they were able to clean it up four hour, in four hours. Three people with hoses were able to wipe or wash this down and open it. And we had the opening the day after of this event. But again, it's about designing for durability here. I mean, these urban environments are fascinating and, and exciting for people. Every, again, people want to touch the water. They want to get to the water. It's like a fireplace on a cold winter night. You want to be near it. There's something magical about it. And now we're in the process of, of planning and designing um, um, some work in Memphis, uh, which has to do with South Cypress Creek. But in 2011, they had a terrible flooding condition uh, caused by the Mississippi River. But primarily, that was because of the backwaters. It was not the Mississippi that did it. It was that backwater watershed um, <clears throat> collided with an with a over, overflowing Mississippi River and created the, the real problem. Um, and through Greenprint and Shelby County, we really started to look at, you know, how do these watersheds relate to one another? And then you start to look at what is the socioeconomic impact to those neighborhoods? And wouldn't you know it, the most uh, challenged uh, economic neighborhood had the most flood impact. 
right? And, it's, and it just breaks your heart. Um, but we were able to get into the neighborhood and work with the community and talk through kind of urban design principles, simple things like how does your neighborhood stay intact when 50% of the lots are vacant? And of the 50% remaining lots, 30 to 40% of them are um, derelict or abandoned. So it, it's a uh, very challenging um, conversation. We looked at typologies. Um, it looked at, at what a neighborhood could actually do, what assets in the neighborhood are really important to try to leverage. Um, because, again, you have to really understand that, you know, uh, this neighborhood was just devastated and had been. It's not the first time that it had flooded. Um, and then we sort of break down and, and even further and look at talking to people. They wanted to be bought, bought out. Well, why do you want to be bought out? What happens? Who pays for that? How, how does that then assure a neighborhood stays intact? And uh, these conversations have become very personal. Uh, and then we looked at sort of what, what actually happens in inventory of the existing buildings, and then what happens if you look at the lots, um, if there's a, a, an effective property that's in reasonable condition and it's near four vacant lots, is there a way to aggregate a lot or two so these people could have more uh, space allowed for more gardening? Uh, and then whether it was a community lot or flood lot, we, we sort of sectored that based on mapping the floodwaters. Um, and then each one of these has sort of a pretty detailed kind of summary of what, what would happen uh, if you combine lots and, and provide a little more space to people who wanted it. Um, and then what flood lots would look like that you'd expect they would flood uh, and you'd receive that water through resiliency. And then the various sort of community lots. And then, of course, um, uh, rotating to, to a nature lot, which would mean we know this, this area will flood annually or uh, every fourth or fifth year, let's return that to nature and really try to redistribute the green infrastructure back into the watershed. <coughs> and with that, I'll turn it back to Ellen. And um, thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And I have been alerted that we had some live cast issues for the first 15 minutes, but uh, so I wanted to let everyone know that we are also video recording and that will be um, available online within two days. So just so you know. Um, okay, so I'd like to now introduce our third panelist, uh, Adam Ortiz. Uh, Adam is the director uh, of the Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection, a uh, $140 million agency with 300 employees and contractors. The department oversees programs for watershed restoration, greenhouse gas reduction, renewable energy, sustainability, and environmental compliance. Previously, Adam served as the director of the Department of Environment for Prince George's County, uh, Maryland, where he oversaw a successful $100 million uh, public-private partnership for stormwater and led the state in recycling and composting for three years in a row. Uh, Adam, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Ellen, and thank you for everybody for uh, putting today together, and thank you all for showing up. I'm sure there's many constituents, whether you live in Prince George's County or Montgomery County, so I'm pleased to be working for you. If you live in Washington, D.C., and you think your rents are a little too high, I'm happy to rep recommend some neighborhoods in suburban <laughs> Maryland to you. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about some of the projects I've been involved with um, as a local implementer of green infrastructure um, in suburban Maryland. Um, in Prince George's County, um, almost 10 years ago um, to, the, to the day, uh, we cut the ribbon on the first green complete street 
in the United States. I'm going to talk about that project in a minute, but incidentally, that project um, got a big boost from President Obama's stimulus package. Um, and reasons I'll describe in a minute, we had been um, planning an upgrade in a Green Street for some time, and we're raising the money from our little working class town. And then President Obama um, was asking for shovel-ready projects. So because we had the design in hand and we had some funding in place, we were a candidate, and we were one of the very first um, projects to be funded under ARA. So looking back almost 10 years later, you, um, I'm deeply appreciative of the investment at the federal level of local green infrastructure. So Edmiston is a little town in Prince George's County. Uh, Prince George's County is the county to the east of Washington, D.C. It's about a million people. Um, and uh, the town of Edmiston is a little working class town. It's on the Anacostia River. It's uh, 1,400 residents, which is smaller than a high school. It's also very diverse. It's uh, about equal parts white, black, and Hispanic. And it's diverse in every way, except there's no rich people there. So, <laughs> but it's kind of an interesting history because the town was actually settled by freed slaves after the Civil War. So there's a sort of equity and environmental justice connection that continued to, to this day. So I became mayor in 2005, and um, the town had flooded three years in a row. And uh, the town is engineered in the floodplain for the 100-year flood, which means that once every 100 years it floods. So you can tell that that uh, math wasn't quite working anymore uh, because of the severity of climate change and all the changes that we had. So um, I won't bore you with all the stories about the flooding and how we mitigated it, but what we learned was that the impacts um, that we have on development um, is paid for somewhere downstream. So although our little town was on the Anacostia River, our town never, in those three years, never once flooded from the river itself because there was a levee system that, that, um, that held the, during those three storms. The little town flooded three years in a row because of impervious surface and development that created such runoff volume that our little town was overwhelmed over and over. In one year, 60 homes were underwater. Uh, it was quite devastating. So what we learned is that we wanted to be responsible in the way that we were building. So governments are in charge of infrastructure. You know, all infrastructure has an expiration date which means that uh, we have uh, an opportunity to upgrade and take it to the next level, 2.0, 3.0, 5.0. .0. So we wanted to create a green, complete street. Uh, so we worked with a local design firm and the University of Maryland to design a street that was completely sustainable from top to bottom, not just so it could withstand weather impacts, but that it could be development that is net positive on the environment rather than net zero or negative on the environment. So this was the original street, and I'll just take you from top to bottom. Uh, number one, a lot of invasive trees, and you can see an inconsistent tree canopy. Um, number two, um, these are old uh, 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 sulfur um, uh, street lights, the kind of orange lights, um, very energy intensive. Um, number, uh, number three, um, not ADA compliant sidewalks. Number four, uh, no bike lanes. And number five, regular curb and gutter on the side of the street. So when the water came, the water would run off the street right into the storm drain and be piped directly into the Anacostia River. So all the pollution that's, um, that settles uh, on the street is washed off. Everything from vehicles, everything from um, airborne particulates are, are washed off. And then when it gets backed up or when it's overwhelmed, it doesn't um, flow fast enough and the little town gets overwhelmed. So we re redesigned it, and this is, um, this is the conceptual drawing, and I'll show you um, what we actually built in a minute. So we uh, restored the canopy with um, all native trees, 100% native trees. Uh, number two, uh, we replaced the whole street, which is about three quarters of a mile, with LED lights. And we're seeing more LED lights now in parking lots in particular. Slowly they're getting onto the streets. But this was the first street that I know of, at least on the East Coast, that was completely LED in the year 2009. Um, three uh, wide sidewalks, four bike lanes. Um, you know, Washington, D.C. is um, awash in bike lanes, which is a great thing. But at the time, uh, there wasn't a lot of bike uh, accessibility. And number five, and importantly, in tying into um, to our presentation here today and Mark's comments um, was having bioretention uh, and stormwater capture along every inch of the street. So um, what we did was this. So this is what green infrastructure looks like, uh, curbside in a little town. 
Um, you can see uh, elevated crosswalks, so there's pe pe uh, pedestrian protection. The trees haven't quite grown yet because this was taken in 2009, um, but they're much bigger now. Uh, native trees, um, you see some uh, local magnolias, Virginia magnolias here, switchgrass, uh, the LED lights, and then these little red maples uh, coming up. Also notice uh, the bike lane, but the curb cut. So uh, most streets are crowned, so the water runs off on the side, so it doesn't pool in the middle, bad for vehicles. On the side, and that's usually where it goes into the storm drain. But with curb cuts like that, in a vegetated area, the water then is diverted into the natural area where it can be filtered, where those pollutants can be captured, and I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So that sort of interrupts um, the sort of pollution pipeline into local waters and also decentralizes where the water goes. So it doesn't uh, accumulate as much in one place as fast, which has uh, important uh, impacts to prevent flooding. Um, this is a project in Montgomery County. This is uh, Dennis Avenue, which is in the Wheaton area. Um, this is um, a bigger bioretention than the ones that you saw on the Green Street, but you can see a lot of the same principles where the water is running off onto the side, being captured. Um, there it's being filtered, but you can also see there, because it's growing in a little bit more, the beautification impacts. So one of the things that, thing that we, we've been focusing in the metropolitan Maryland region is that we're trying to locate these projects uh, in historically under-invested uh, neighborhoods. So, you know, we're here in Washington, D.C., where we see lots of neighborhoods exploding. You know, when there's market forces, the developers, you know, pay for the sidewalk improvements, they pay for the trees, they, you know, put money into the local park. But in those neighborhoods that don't have those market forces working, they deserve beautification as well. So as government leaders, we have choices where we invest um, our infrastructure projects, and I argue to put them in working class neighborhoods as much as possible. So this is kind of how it works uh, for bioretention. Um, you can see sort of from top to bottom, um, there's uh, the plant media that you see, hopefully pretty trees and flowers. Uh, that's important from an ecological standpoint, for reasons you could imagine, but it's also important from a curb appeal perspective. What we often not talk about in infrastructure conversations is that we want to make our neighborhoods beautiful, right? We don't just want to drive, you know, we, we, know we, it's, it, we don't just want to pour concrete, but we want to make them livable in places that we enjoy passing through every day, um, places that we're happy to come home to every day. So that's why it's important to give it a 2.0, 3.0 um, upgrade where it's something beautiful. Um, so that's really important. Secondly um, is a, a soil medium. So it's a, it's a rich soil uh, mix where plants can grow in, but also um, where there's um, uh, natural processes, microbacterial processes that break down pollutants. So nitrogen and phosphorus and all sorts of bad stuff that comes off from cars actually can be handled by nature in the right proportion if it's engineered properly. So Mother Nature is a smart lady. She's a pretty good engineer. So uh, we let her do her work. And you see a little bit farther down different grades of gravel. And then that helps um, uh, the water filter down, come through. And then at the, at the bottom, there's a perforated pipe, a PVC pipe that then captures the clean water and then discharges it to the local stream. So, you know, with these little installations like this, we're actually cleaning the water um, every step of the way, drop by drop. Um, also, they don't have to be so big. Even though you may get a lot of water, it's really only the first half inch or inch, uh, depending on the circumstances of that first flush of water that needs to be treated, and then the surface generally is clean. So that was a lot more than you probably asked for in terms of how bioretention works, but it's worth noting. Some curb appeal stuff, uh, Maryland State Flower, important to notice. Um, but there's also other applications. Uh, engineering and industry is catching up. The prices for this stuff is going down a lot. And uh, these are permeable pavers. So you can see they have some architectural value, but there's spaces in between the bricks where the water can come down and then, uh, and then filter underneath. Um, this is actually a per permeable asphalt, um, so uh, uh, I'm s the permeable concrete, but there's also permeable asphalt that has space in between, um, in between the material so it can also filter through there, but still provide the hardscape. So it doesn't always have to be green stuff. It can be gray stuff, but it can be good green gray stuff. <laughs> All right, so you're getting the idea. Um, here's another curb cut there to the left. So um, it's pretty simple engineering when you think about it, but just that sort of um, 
switch about trying to be sustainable and responsible for everything that we build in our impact can make a big difference. This is another project we had in Forest Estates, which is um, in Forest Glen, Metro Stop on the, on the Red Line. And just back to the curb appeal piece. So um, we have a lot of neighborhoods that are like this. Don't have um, a lot of beauty, don't have a lot of ecological activity, have a lot of turf grass. Alice and I, Montgomery County resident, were talking about turf grass, um, limited to no ecological value. Um, but with green infrastructure, you know, we can really, really create ecological value. Um, we can uh, create curb appeal and, uh, and we can, you know, help clean the air um, as we go. So more projects, you get the idea. Uh, in the minute or so I have left, I wanted to talk about the co-benefits of green infrastructure. And this is something, um, as being a part of this industry for the last 10 years, has been one of the most important parts about green infrastructure. And, you know, we're in the middle of a robust debate about the Green New Deal, and uh, that's an important discussion to have. What's great about this work is that unlike, you know, putting down some concrete or asphalt, there's, it doesn't really do much for you after you do that. Um, but with stuff like this, you have lots of co-benefits. I talked about uh, the greening. I talked about the revitalization, that we can put it in neighborhoods that are underinvested to make them more beautiful and provide tree canopy. But importantly, we talk about jobs. So these are sustainable jobs. Sustainable um, in every sense of the word. So to put this kind of stuff in, you need all sorts of layers of workers. You need um, landscape architects. We have a few in the room. Uh, we need engineers. Uh, we need uh, the building trades uh, to pour the concrete and actually do the work. Uh, we need uh, uh, gardeners and landscapers and nurseries. So just think of the supply chain here. What a diverse supply chain we're creating when we're doing this work. And then it's not dead infrastructure. It's not great infrastructure. It's living infrastructure that needs to be cared for. So we have ongoing maintenance. Um, so this is a great opportunity for mom and pop landscaping uh, companies to get involved and local businesses to get involved. Um, I'm new in this job in Montgomery County, but um, when I left my job in Prince George's, same job, um, we had just finished a three-year project, $100 million green infrastructure program, three-year program, where we retrofitted 2,000 acres, um, very successful. Um, in that project, we created uh, more than $130 million of local economic benefit. Um, more than 80% of our contracting went to local small and minority businesses. And for those of you who know the region, you know that Prince George's County is sort of the underdog county where we don't have as much commercial uh, development, don't have as much, much wealth. Um, and importantly, um, we created a sustainable economic green industry there. We're going to continue to build stuff like this. We have businesses that are based there. They're small, uh, local, and minority businesses that are going to continue to flourish. They have expertise, and they're going to compete, and they are competing around the region for more work. So, uh, so the nexus between environment and uh, economic benefit couldn't be more clear. So if there's questions at the end, I'm happy to take them, and I'll stick around afterwards. But it's been a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate it, Ellen. Thank you so much, Adam. And now our final, uh, certainly not least, panelist is uh, Dr. Jalan White Newsom. Dr. Jalan White Newsom is a senior program officer with the Kresge Foundation's Environment Program in Troy, Michigan. And she is responsible for grant making related to climate change, urban flooding, and public health. Prior to Kresge, Jalan's career has spanned various sectors and fields, including state government, academia, science-based NGOs, engineering, public health, and working for a community-based environmental justice organization, specifically on federal policy. Her passion for people and for justice continues to be the thread throughout her work. A proud native Detroiter, Jalan holds a BS in chemical engineering, an MS in environmental engineering, and a PhD in environmental health sciences. Please welcome Jalan. Good afternoon. 
Oh, you can do better than that. How are you? I know, I know, I tell you. Well, first of all, thank you so much to Aslan EESI for this opportunity. Thank you to my wonderful speakers. They have made it easy for me because why would I try and make some slides? that wouldn't be as pretty as landscape architects and planners. So you have no slides for me. So unfortunately, you have to sit here and listen to me. So I apologize in advance. Um, but before I begin my remarks, um, I always like to start off acknowledging the indigenous lands that we're on. And so the folks that were here before we occupied this space, the Algonquin Indians, because I think it's important to understand that for us to move forward, we have to recognize and acknowledge our past. So uh, I always like to do that. But I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and had the wonderful opportunity as a high schooler to work for Dow Chemical Corporation in Midland, Michigan. And what I soon found out as a 14 and a half year old is that there are certain communities that unfortunately are inundated and overexposed to environmental hazards. Um, they wake up with dirty air. They uh, unfortunately have to drink dirty water. There are waste facilities right outside their door. They're inundated with truck traffic and all these sorts of things. And what I realized soon is that it wasn't just in Midland, Michigan and some of the facilities uh, where Dow was, but it was everywhere and most importantly in my own backyard. And I realized that I had family members, church members, um, folks that uh, again were suffering from these environmental insults is what I'll call it. And, and so as we talk about solutions, primarily green infrastructure, it's important that we understand the context of the solutions that we're offering and remember that the reason that we're doing this wonderful stuff is to hopefully impact the lives of people. So for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to try and share a couple of things and uh, you will probably, I'm going to try not to go over. So please, the person with the card, just wave and dance and do what you have to do to, to get me to, to shut up. But I'm going to start with a couple of brief highlights of the environmental justice movement because I don't want to assume that folks know what environmental justice is. Um, provide a little bit of information about Kresge's definition of climate resilience and then end with sharing some tactics about how you might want to think about uh, as leaders in this room, architects, engineers, congressional folk, uh, tactics that you can use to really help enhance community resilience in the face of climate change. So um, very quickly, um, how many of you know what environmental justice is? Okay, well that's okay because I don't see all the hands in the room up. And so I will encourage you to do research on your own because there's no way in a minute and a half I can give you the full history of the environmental justice movement. But I'm going to highlight a couple of things that will hopefully set the context of, of what we're talking about here. So Dr. Martin Luther King uh, led a strike of sanitation workers in Memphis. And many folks point to that as the first kind of incident in the environmental justice movement because it was about sanitation. It was about the rights of African American workers and getting fair wages. But folks also point to this incident in Warren County, North Carolina, where essentially this rural African American community uh, was, was decided by the governor of North Carolina to be the spot for these new PCB landfills. And essentially, if you do the history, folks lay down in the street in front of these trucks to prevent these, this, you know, again, uh, this egregious act of, of, of plopping pollution in this community where there were plenty of other spaces across the, 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 the state. So again, from those incidences, the United Church of Christ, again, this is something else you can Google, pulled together this report that actually documented the fact that there were more toxic waste sites uh, in communities of color, black and brown communities. And so this was kind of the first really non-anecdotal evidence that this was happening. And so from that, uh, right here in D.C. in the early 90s, the first National People of Color Summit occurred where all these leaders, grassroots organizations from across the country came together and say, hey, you know what, I'm feeling that. I hear, I have, I'm dealing with the same stuff. And from that, uh, then principles of environmental justice were created, which is something that if you're a true environmental justice group, you, that is what, how you do your work. So I encourage you to Google principles of environmental justice. But from that, on the federal side, uh, under Clinton's watch, Executive Order 12898 was the first executive order around environmental justice. And this was, I would say, maybe one of the first attempts to hold our federal agencies accountable a little bit, or at least get them to recognize that environmental justice should be something that they should consider in how they do their work. So again, 
that was a quick blast of the EJ movement, but I share with you this for a couple things, share with you for a couple reasons. The first is that environmental injustice is really, the, the, it's, it's environmental racism. And so I know sometimes racism is an uncomfortable word, but when we think about the reasons why certain communities end up in these places, it's not because of anything they've done but it's because of the institutional racism and the structural racism that exists across this country. The second thing is that people's lives are actually cut short because they are living in these places. So the quantity of life and the quality of their life is impacted. And so then we throw on climate change and that makes it even worse, right? So that is another layer of complexity for these communities that are already dealing with a bunch of stuff now you have the threat of climate change. And so whenever we look around at the things that are happening in this world, and I can't turn on the news or Lester Holt and not see something about climate change, but it is our black and brown communities that are hit the first and worst, and sometimes unable to recover in the same way. So that leads me into the conversation about what we're trying to do with the Kresge Foundation. Um, I've been a program officer there for a couple of years, still learning the wonderful world of philanthropy, but the one thing that impressed me about the Kresge Foundation is that um, we focus on low-income communities in America's cities. And so when you think about building climate resilience and building community resilience, it's important that we address it holistically. And when we say holistically, we tackle the mitigation part. So we try and look at ways to reduce the sources of pollution. We also look at adaptation. So how are we gonna actually try and figure out how to adjust to this new normal that we're living in? But then we also really support efforts to build social cohesion. And that's critical because when you think about these climate disruptions that we see, whether it's the heat waves in Chicago, the hurricanes, pick your place, the folks that tend to sustain are those folks that come from communities that are connected and well networked. So how do we support building community capacity and community cohesion? And so as I think about the work of this committee and you know when we talk about this comprehensive definition of what climate resilience and community resilience means there's a couple of things that I want to share with you that come to mind four tactics that I hope you will consider one is around using good science and innovation the second tactic is around removing barriers the third is around conducting an EJ analysis and the fourth is around recognizing community power and expertise Okay, I know I went through that fast, but that's all right. Hopefully you got it. So when we talk about good science and innovation, so I am a nerd. I love science. I love data. Always have. And I think it's important. It's important as planners. It's important as community folks that you understand what are the things that could possibly happen and how do we how do we plan for that? How, how do we make sure that our folks are safe and comfortable? And so I was an author on the National Climate Assessment and you know, one of those multiple reports that tell you that you know, our world is about to end, but it also gives us data and ideas about how we can adapt better despite these impacts and risks. So the importance of using science to drive your planning is extremely important, but not just the traditional science. There are so many organizations that are using citizen science to help, particularly around flooding. And I want to highlight the work of two of our grantee partners, the Anthropocene Alliance, uh, which again, they organize national flood groups across the country using social media, documenting where flooding is happening, and kind of using this as a supplemental data set to go into their local uh, decision makers and say, hey, this is where the green infrastructure needs to land, or hey, we need a policy for this. So really using that citizen collected data to really drive policy change. I'd also say Freshwater Future is another organization that has actually developed an app, again, using social media to, again, get to policy solutions. But I don't want to just focus on the citizen science, but it's also our utilities that are doing great things in terms of using data to drive their planning, their capital planning, and how they're forecasting for 10 and 20 years. And I'll put out there the city of Seattle, the city of San Francisco, and I would pick on San Francisco because they are actually thinking about not only just how we plan, but how we actually plan together. Now, I would, you know, maybe want to ask Adam in terms of one of the things that I hear from our city folks is that you know, we work in silos, you know, so you'll have your transportation, you'll have your environment, you'll have your ever. And so San Francisco is really trying to take a look, hey, how can we actually all work together, 
pool our resources together to not only address the flooding problems, but the health problems, the transportation problems, and all these things. So when you talk about innovation, uh, that's what I mean. Um, the second thing, tactic, is around removing barriers. There are always multiple barriers to building climate resilient communities. We could probably have a three hour briefing on that. But the one, the couple that I'm going to bring up is the access to education, the access to decision making, and financing. There are a couple of organizations that I want to highlight. One of our grantee partners, EcoAction out of Atlanta, that I hope you all will look up, has done a great job in not only assembling a large watershed learning network for the city of Atlanta that's not only composed of community-based organizations, but municipal leaders, academics, all these great folks, but they have actually developed a curriculum to train their community folks how to engage in the decision-making process. Because one of the things is that it's not that black and brown folks, which is all this, always this assumption that I hear and I cringe, black and brown folks don't care about the environment. It's just really understanding the process and the leverage points to engage and where they can get in. And so EcoAction has done a wonderful job of doing that. I also want to highlight our work um, with, and, and I don't see my folks in the room, but the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. So as you talk about financial barriers, um, you know, the cost of green infrastructure I hear from, from my folks in the field is, is kind of this barrier. Is it worth paying for? You know, are we going to get the return on the investment? And in addition to a lot of the co-benefits that you will see from green stormwater infrastructure, one of the big barriers is how, you know, how does a little city pay for it? And, and my love is for those small to medium-sized cities that are underserved and don't have a lot, and, and how do we get them to play? So um, one of the things that we do, we work very closely with our social investment practice inside of Kresge. And so we're trying to do a couple things. You know, I have grant capital as a grant maker, but grants are not going to pay for the infrastructure challenges in this country. We have a lot of private partners that we can work with. We have money out there that a lot of communities don't know how to access for many reasons. And so improving the access, not only um, for municipal leaders and communities, um, as well as making sure that we have opportunities to partner uh, and, and kind of build in this, this social investment landscape. So we're doing a couple of things. In Baltimore, particularly, we're supporting the development of an environmental impact bond. And we can get into that a little bit later. In Detroit, we're conducting actually a feasibility study for a watershed improvement district that will not only look at managing stormwater in this particular particular open air market in downtown Detroit, but also what are the economic benefits can come from that. And then we're also supporting project developers that have a social equity vision and frame to work with utilities and folks that want to better use the money they have and they haven't been able to actually operationalize to put G green infrastructure uh, in places that would be overlooked. And they've done some great work in St. Louis and I can definitely share some information about that in our conversation. The third point, how am I doing on time? Am I, I don't even know where the person is. OK, you're good? OK, cool. All right, <laughs> conducting an EJ analysis. So I will try, try and talk to this very quickly. So in, my, in the olden days, with the Clean Power Plan, which somebody mentioned, I think, Ellen, you mentioned the Clean Power Plan, maybe? Or somebody did. OK, well, um, that was the first time that the Environmental Protection Agency conducted an EJ analysis. And what that essentially is is what it sounds like. Really looking at this big policy solution and asking the questions, what are going to be the impacts or the unintentional consequences of this policy on the communities, again, that I talked about in the beginning that are already dealing with multiple environmental hazards. And so really using this of asking the question, who benefits? Who's at the table? Who is actually helping craft the solutions? And after this policy is in place, is there something that's going to happen that we didn't think about? That is essentially, in a truncated half minute, what an environmental justice analysis is. Of course, you need data. You need people to help shape that. But that is something that's critically important as you talk about any type of solution, including green infrastructure. Because the one thing you want to make sure of that I hear from my folks is that it doesn't cause displacement. Because once things get pretty, folks want to move in. And we got to make sure that there are ways that we protect those communities that are in these places where green infrastructure is happening for whatever reason. So that's the quick and dirty on the EJ analysis. And last but certainly not least is the importance of recognizing community power. And I can say this enough. Um, I don't like the term vulnerable communities because to be called vulnerable as a person, I wouldn't like that, would you? 
I don't want to be known as vulnerable. What I will say is we have climate vulnerable places, but I will tell you most of the communities that I've worked at worked with are super duper resilient because they have undergone so much stress from multiple levels, environmental stresses and other stresses. And so as we think about the community power that already exists in these places, it's an opportunity to harness that and to harness that expertise. So as we talk about solutions for anything, recognize the power of the people that are the most impacted and your solutions and your policies will be even stronger. So with that, a couple of things and I'll end. Um, the main point, one of the main points that I want you to hopefully share again is that we have to address structural and institutional racism head on because we can write policies all day, but they will not get at the sources of the problem. The second is that communities always should speak for themselves. So that means they actually have to be in the room and not just after the solution is already created. Climate change does not affect everyone the same. So one silver bullet solution for one community is not going to work for the other. And again, I'm really encouraged about green stormwater infrastructure being one of the solutions that we really push at Kresge through all of our grant making practice because it has those multiple benefits. So it's not only the fact that you're, you know, getting in compliance, but it's public health benefits. Who doesn't like to look at green stuff and make you feel good? Um, and then it makes, you know, just proud of your community. So with that, thank you for the opportunity and I hope I didn't go over time. No, that was just great. Thank you so much. So I have questions, but I'll, uh, I'll be a good moderator and I'll open it up to, uh, to the audience. Um, lots, of, lots of great information from each of the panelists. And um, so we do have time for, um, for Q&A and I will just open it up to the first brave person. Yes, sir. Oh, we have a we have a microphone coming, sir. Oh, a microphone. Okay, I'll start again. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Bruce Hamilton from the National Science Foundation, and Jerome, you mentioned I I believe the relationship between science and research, and uh, the objectives that you outlined, and I wonder if you might be able to comment a little bit further on what you might envision as the relationship between science research and the objectives that you were talking about. Okay, Bruce, and I want to be clear, the objectives around what before I start responding? Well, for example, environmental justice, mm -hmm. uh, research on environmental justice and connecting that to actual implementation along the lines you were talking about. Great, and, and I'll share with you an example. So. Um, you know, and as I'll, I'll put my researcher hat on, and the one thing that um, really, um, I, I guess, has been a challenge is really making research meaningful and actionable. Um, you know, when you talk about, uh, when I was going through my doctoral program, it was like, okay, publish, publish, publish. But I, I, I tried to push back and say, we're just not publishing for naught, but how is this actually going to impact and change the community? And so, What's awesome is that there are a couple of organizations that, that are working towards this. Um, the Center for American Progress, um, the Union of Concerned Scientists has set up opportunities for community scientists to work with research, researchers to create a shared agenda. And that is so critically important because oftentimes our black and brown communities, in my opinion, are overstudied. And so folks come in and fly in and collect all this data and then leave and then what happens. So when you talk about creating that true authentic partnership between researchers that are from the community and researchers that care not to just use folks as, as data and get out is, is critical. Um, and there was something else that I wanted to say but I can't remember. But, but yeah, so there's examples, Union of Concerned Scientists, Center for American Progress, which is a program um, that we're funding with the Center for Earth and Energy Democracy, which would be a great case study to look at, um, and something else, but we can talk after. Great, thank you. Anyone else? In the way back.
Hi, uh, I'm Stacia Turner with the Conservation Fund, um, and I work as a program manager of um, park projects in urban low-income communities. So my question is if each panelist could um, give a brief comment about um, what you think are the best strategies for exploring the uh, best synergies for the intersection of green infrastructure construction and development and green jobs because what I've been seeing at least on the ground in my program is that because a lot of municipalities are just gearing up momentum to start having consistent green infrastructure um, capital improvements there hasn't been a lot of coordinated strategies around trying to have the construction and maintenance of those projects come from within the communities um, especially if they're in low-income communities making sure that there's actually job opportunities from within the community and not outside um, you know landscape design firms who are managing and maintaining those so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that I'm happy to start. No, um, Stacia, I really appreciate that that question. Um, you know, governments have a lot of discretion about site selection, and uh, funders also have a lot of discretion about what they fund. Uh, what I would encourage is a partnership to try to find an intersection of a few different things. Um, Dr. White Newsom mentioned um, communities that are environmentally distressed. So we want to put money in places that have an environmental uh, benefit. Um, areas that tend to be underinvested, uh, so often communities of color, but working class communities uh, are important. And then uh, from that intersection of you know, places where we can make the most progress, um, partnerships are really important. So it's, um, it's relatively easy to put money into a community but it's a little harder to get the outcomes uh, that are required. So if uh, the focus is jobs and local or smaller minority job uh, development, business development, I think it's really important to partner with local chambers of commerce uh, who know the community. Um, there's um, in every community um, under uh, uh, federal workforce laws, there's workforce development boards um, that can um, also create a pipeline of workers. And then the, sort of the key thing, and it gets kind of geeky uh, from a procurement standpoint, but that the, whoever the contracting agency is um, develops a performance-based contract. That, and usually performance-based contracts for infrastructure projects are on time or on budget. That's important. But if we're trying to get to other social goals, you know, particularly wealth building or uh, employment, those should be built in as too, uh, as well. Uh, in my experience, we had 50% um, um, as our benchmark for local small and minority, but um, because we partnered with the local community college and the local chambers and the local workforce board, our outcomes were actually between 80 and 90% in all those categories, which is really unheard of in the environmental space. Um, but a uh, really great question, Stacia, and as you can tell, I'm, I can geek out for the rest of the afternoon on this issue, but uh, I'll hang around afterwards if, if you have any further questions or want to partner. I would add <clears throat> that what, what I see in, in the design world is about educating community, community. And, and that's, not, that's not literally, you know, the, the, the language that we speak to, but it's about <clears throat> learning the personalities of the community in what their interests and where their interests lie. In Memphis, it was, it was, it was really eye-opening to engage in those conversations um, when most of the community uh, wanted to retreat to high ground. And, and we came in at one session and were sort of embarrassed by saying, you know, why don't we have these great urban farms and these, these people who live in such modest lives said, well, we have our gardens. Why do we need an urban farm in our neighborhood? And they're absolutely right. So I think so much of it has to do with how do you um, connect in these communities to understand the issues. The other piece is when we design public open space very, very early in that conversation, in that design process, we start talking about 
adding demand on an already stressed um, maintenance uh, uh, community within the municipalities we work. And you never hear about municipalities adding to their maintenance crews. Yeah. All you hear is the deduction of their maintenance crews. And the truth is these public spaces um, can be designed to be less maintenance intensive, and we really try to accomplish that. But the reality is they require maintenance. Um, unless you, you know, in, in, in Memphis where you really get into the wilds of the river environment, the only maintenance that's going to happen there is nature is going to flush itself and trees will fall and nobody needs to come and, and remove them. Um, but, but the truth is we see this all over the country where uh, there's a real lack of, not a lack of commitment, there's just a lack of resources. The community only has so much resource. Uh, and we, we talk a lot about it. And we make progress, uh, but not as much as one would like. I'll add there are some really interesting and good programs and partnerships that are happening around this issue. Um, DC Water uh, has been a leader in this and working with some of the other kind of water and sewer authorities and other cities, uh, really focusing on the training, um, the green jobs training of what's required, how do you deal with construction and maintenance of green infrastructure, and really trying to make that match with the local populations, um, including a certification that would go along with it um, so the folks who have gone through it um, are, you know, really are going to be very employable and in demand and, and have something that will help them in the market. So there are some things that are happening to help us get where we need to go there. Thank you. I think right here. Oh, could I add something to that? Why you have Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, that, that's okay. I mean, they, they are the experts, but just a couple of things. Um, the one is that as a funder, we have the power to say where we are going to put our money. And so when we talk with partners and we're talking about projects, part of that criteria is saying, you know, if we're going to fund green and storm water infrastructure projects, then we want to make sure that a certain percent of the hires, a certain percent of the benefits go to folks from that community, not from the outside. So there is a power that we can use. Um, in terms of the green storm water infrastructure certification, some of our partners, um, well, that's a great opportunity. It's not accessible to most. It costs a lot of money. So if there's a way that we can figure out um, to fund and support that certification for our lower income communities that want to get into the GSI maintenance work, that would be fabulous, but just recognizing that there's sometimes barriers there. And then I'd also lastly list up um, uh, Green Infrastructure Exchange, which is a, a, a national network of green infrastructure leaders like Adam and others um, that come together to talk about workforce development. And there's a particular um, a story about uh, the, this woman in New Jersey that's doing some awesome stuff. So I can't remember who asked the question, but I would want to point to that story because they've actually brought in community folks to help with the maintenance and, you know, from high school to just, it's, it's a wonderful example. So, sorry, Ella. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so, yes, sir. And then... Uh, Richard Hoy from uh, Bethesda, Maryland. Um, I was uh, very taken uh, uh, by your presentation, Dr. White, White Newsom, and uh, um, I would uh, say that, uh, that climate change in particular is bringing us uh, into the point where we have to uh, value everyone in the community in order to make a difference in climate change, and that that's going to take some, uh, some changes in the structures of our uh, communities. In my, my community, we have structural segregation. Uh, through our housing policies, and uh, so it's it really it's a real impediment, both for those who are uh, priced out, but also for those who are trying to change it, uh, because it's um, it's it's the bubble that uh, is so hard to pierce. Um, but on to and I'd like to know from all, from all the all the panelists how we can we can do modeling uh, that involves the community and and the experts and the fire chiefs and the all the people who say no at the end of the process, get them in at the beginning, like a health impact assessment, and model different outcomes, and and evaluate them um, uh, for their for their for their total benefit. Um, but my issue in particular is uh, 
is our um, our uh, utility management. It seems like we have uh, we do have uh, a a forest uh, of uh, strips of land that would make a forest of all the rights of way for roads, utility lines, pipelines, and so on, and it's managed in a in a in a disaggregated manner. We actually uh, cut down um, enough uh, trees from these parcels to supplant one-third of all the lumber used in the United States on these little strips of land. And we don't look on it collectively as an opportunity to grow and reforest the trees not only for shade and stormwater management, but for use. And, uh, and the co-benefits of using the land below the tree uh, for stormwater runoff, the tree for shade, and so on, uh, and utility rights away that are combined and not dug independently, separately, one after the other in the same place, uh, could yield an enormous number of benefits. So maybe any, so one of you can speak on uh, any attempts around the country to look in a complete manner at, at this opportunity. Uh, great question, uh, Richard. And you know, I think uh, as we get more sophisticated in our public responses to any issue, we realize that they're all interconnected. You know, we, the environmental issues are not just about the environment, they're also about social and economic and cultural decisions that have been made 10, 20, 50, or 100 years earlier. So um, our responses have to be multifaceted as well. I think there are a handful of good examples. Uh, Dr. White Newsom mentioned uh, the Green Infrastructure Exchange. They've highlighted um, a handful of uh, program uh, projects that um, that have been success and the whole idea is that we are information sharing from coast to coast on it um, I really like your point about um, having all the stakeholders at the table um, that's always easiest facilitated when you have leadership that requires it so that could be political um, a county executive uh, for example or a mayor that requires everybody to be at the table or a funder that requires that uh, for a project to get funded, folks are at the table. Um, the, uh, the silo issue was a real issue between utilities, between departments of transportation, between sustainability folks. No question about it, but it's not rocket science. You know, we can, we can definitely get past it. Um, and then I also want to go to another point that couldn't be underscored more is um, the importance of uh, folks on the ground. In every community, there's a lot of wisdom, and you expressed uh, a bunch of it about your neighborhood. Um, the top has to meet the bottom. It has to be top down and bottom up at the same time and come together, because those folks on the ground are going to know, um, you know all the ins and outs about the history of the land, um, the uses, things that utilities that may not show up on the map as well. And uh, you know, one of the biggest silos is, um, quite frankly, utilities. You know, those uh, power line rights of way, um, uh, you know, are a tremendous wasted opportunity. So, um, so I concur <laughs> in, in a nutshell, and, uh, and I really appreciate the, the question, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with you. I'm sorry. So that, totally agree. And the only thing that I would add is there's an organization called Earth Economics that works uh, out of Washington. And they do what you call an economic valuation that includes not only, you know, the policy benefits, but the social environment on everything. And so they've done this for several different communities, particularly around green stormwater infrastructure and, and working with communities to say, hey, this is what we want to see. Can you help us build the case? So I encourage folks to check them out as well, because that gets totally what you're saying. It's, it's hard to do that. I wanted to interject a question. Um, related to that. How is the best way to inform the public? I know public notices in the paper don't really do it. Did you have experience with that, Adam, or anyone else? Yeah, I've had a, I've probably been a part of more than 100 projects like this. And um, you got to invest the time in the community. And uh, the public notices are awful, yeah. an awful, <laughs> positively terrible way to, uh, to get, so it, 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 the trick is not to call your own meeting, but to go to the community's meeting. Go to their space, invest the time. Um, in my experience, it takes at least three meetings um, of 
showing plans, getting input, responding, and unless there's something um, uh, really important that has to be addressed, like a, a flooding issue, listen to the community, listen to what they have to say. They have to live with it long after, after we go. And um, I've seen projects that have been very successful where there's a lot of buy-in, and I've seen projects that, um, that have failed because they don't have the, the community buy-in. So that, that, you know, and I call that pre-development. That's the time that is really spent on the ground and it, as it is as important as any, any engineering drawing. I might um, add quickly to that is I, I think what we, where we've had the most success is where we've found leaders within the community who um, could marshal uh, certain community groups to engage in the conversation and then to be really good listeners. Adam's right. If you, you, know, you, have, you ask these people to come to two or three meetings and then you don't listen, boy, <laughs> shame on us. Yeah. It, to be a good listener matters a lot. Works at home, too, with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. And I also recall a, a Colorado legislator uh, who was dealing with flooding there had talked about partnering with, with different community groups, um, trade groups, social organizations who have this regular contact with different community members. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Just... Again, just don't let it be a transactional relationship. Exactly. Not transactional. Spend time even before the plans start going to those communities and just listening and sitting. That's all I would add. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Ben Evans with the Alliance to Save Energy. Um, and we're doing a lot of work here in DC to get uh, Congress to pay more attention to energy efficiency in infrastructure. Um, and, and build it in through policy. And I'm wondering, and maybe it's a question for Nancy Best, um, if what kind of traction you're getting for incorporating this type of, of uh, stuff into um, an infrastructure uh, bill or legislation um, and what specific policies you see as being most effective uh, for doing that? See, I'm trying to think where to start on that one. Um, I, I think there's a lot of interest, uh, and of course, we're you know we're looking at kind of all levels on on trying to get it moving because, as you can kind of hear from uh, some of the recommendations that we we're talking about, there's there's state, there's local, and there's federal pieces of this, all of which can be extraordinarily helpful either in making it happen or in creating barriers um, to having it happen. So there's a like kind of kind of a multi-pronged approach. I'm, I'm looking over for my federal affairs team to see because they were going to be Far more. Where's Roxanne? She's going to be far better <laughs> equipped to answer that question for me. Yeah, I think Nancy um, is the talking point. I have a Ms. Roxanne oh. Blackwell, ASLA. Yes, good afternoon. Um, I think Nancy pointed out in her talking points um, with the, um, the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act. Um, it was just signed by the president in January, but we started advocacy efforts on this particular issue many, many years ago. And we initially went into offices and our arguments fell on deaf ears, um, to be very frank. Um, and in some instances, it was party related. In other instances, it was just not being very familiar with the issue. So we took the approach, we know this is the right thing to do. We know that it's not a partisan issue, and we're going to be persistent, and we're going to be patient. And this was one of the, the biggest um, yields that we've seen, you know, to have a freestanding bill just addressing green infrastructure, we thought was phenomenal. So, you know, my advice would be to not give up. Um, you have partners with us. You have other partners here in the room. I think when we started out, we may have been one of the few talking about green infrastructure, but now we're seeing this issue being um, embraced by a number of entities and organizations. Thank you, Roxanne. And I'd like to just add to that in the sense, and this came up from a number of the speakers uh, about the different, uh, the co-benefits and the different, um, what I always call um, sort of the performance goals. And so looking for all those, those intersections of, uh, you know, a solution that provides, that saves energy, saves money, um, but is also providing health benefits, providing 
uh, amenities for the community, providing, um, you know, just reducing pollution. So um, economic, social, environmental, and it just yeah. um, finding those, those, those cross sections. Yeah. And, and I'll add to that too, thanks Ellen, and thank you Roxanne. The co-benefits of course is key, but even if you're just looking at cost, um, so many of the studies show that if you're dealing with stormwater uh, management issues, green infrastructure is going to be cheaper every time. Uh, and it comes with all of those other benefits. And we have not done a terrific job of really doing the research to monetize the all of those other pieces of benefits that happen at the same time. Um, but if you even just look at, as I said, just look at the what it is just for handling the stormwater, it is the more inexpensive, um, better approach, hands down. And if nothing else, um, that speaks very well to policymakers when they're dealing with, with stormwater issues that they have to, um, to, to attack. Uh, and we were one of the co-writers of a report called Banking on Green, so if you're interested, and it's really that um, particular publication is directed to public policymakers talking about the benefits and really the cost savings of a green infrastructure approach. So you can check that out. I think that and also the a report that has come out from the National Institute of Building Sciences, sort of a, a number of reports on that return on investment from investing in in resilience, you're going to get this this payback. Um, so that's thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, uh, I'm Bill Orleans, uh, who wants his former DOE director director to go back where he came from. Uh, I don't want to dismiss the importance and relevance of there being community meetings, but I certainly want to defend. Uh, the principle that a local government entity who may be desire to be non-transparent and non-responsive should uh, have continue to have the requirement to publish a, a notice, a public notice in, in whatever local circulating paper there is. In too many instances, uh, I think there have been uh, non-transparent, uh, non-responsive governments who would just as soon not have to publish a local notice <laughs> and no one would know about what they, they don't want us to know about. So uh, I believe certainly uh, in response of local governments and plenty of meetings. I'm all for having more meetings, but I want there to be meetings that I've noticed in the lo local legal section good of the paper. Good point. We need, we need that and more. So thank you. Very good point. Did you have a question? I'm Reverend uh, Dr. Jean Wright, and I'm with the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions in Fairfax County. Uh, we're about local advocacy, and we have about, we're interfaith and have about 70 different congregations that are working with us now. Um, so one of the things we have found when we uh, talk with local businesses, and we are advocating for community-wide, county-wide sustainability plan, is that uh, they want to retrofit, they would like to transform their buildings and properties into green. Um, but when they go to the local zoning board or the county zoning board, there are barriers that make it difficult for them to do that. So I'm wondering uh, what your input would be about how to have more of a welcoming, hospitable um, conversation with uh, local zoning boards about rules and regulations related to retrofitting and to uh, becoming green. Thank you. Adam, that sounds like your question. Sounds like my question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Reverend Dr. Wright. Great question. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's critical that, uh, you know, there's the education piece. People need to understand the benefits, and we've talked about a lot of them. Here, the, the master planning process is probably required by law in, in every jurisdiction every 10 years or so. Um, so, you know, so, you know, my guidance and my limited experience would be to, you know, convene your coalition, and that would be the green groups, faith groups, community groups, um, you know, every, every stakeholder you can think of. And since this is environment, you should have a pretty pretty broad coalition because, um, as far as I know, everybody lives in the environment. So I think um, it, it's easy to get those voices and then work um, 
the councils or, or whoever comes up with the plans. I imagine that the zoning board follows the, um, the lead of the legislative body in most cases. Um, so I think that's the place to go. There's so much good literature um, out there. And the, the, um, the point has been raised that a lot of our communities and these um, uh, projects have been studied to death. I don't think they've been studied to death, but there's a lot of examples and there's a lot of people, I think, who could um, you know, provide validation for, for what you're trying to do. Um, and then there's just the, the long-term resilience of green infrastructure. It just looks better. Um, it works with the environment um, rather than the, against the environment. And it's a way of, you know, I, I tend to think of it um, not as, not so much as infrastructure, but more as like parks and public space. Because, you know, our roads aren't just roads, they're, they're public space. You know, they can be anything that we want. So why doesn't the road feel more like a park than a road? Isn't that a more pleasant experience? So I think more and more zoning boards, more and more planners are getting there, um, but, uh, but we still have some work to do. I, I'll just add that even the communities that completely get it have a lot of legacy zoning or whatever requirements uh, and their regulations about the way things have to be built that came from the old standard operating procedure, you know, that were, that were just the pavement is good, that's, that's all fine. And because this is a major shift that we're talking about, so there are a lot of those legacy pieces that are happening. Um, the really, you know, forward leaders and communities like that will kind of work with with interest groups or with the designers um, to say, you know, help us, show us where they're, you know, what the problems are so we can kind of attack them. Uh, one of the things we recommend in the, in the Smart Policies Report, uh, love to see a community take this and embrace it as a case study, is to do a top, um, top to bottom review of all of the regulations and everything that's in, in place to say what is, what is barriers and, and what need, with that climate resilience lens, take a look at everything with that lens and see what has to be changed because there's just, as you're pointing out, there's so many of those legacy barriers just going in the wrong way but they're kind of still in place. Nancy, I'm going to let you have the last word because that was an excellent last word so thank you very much. And uh, I just want to thank you all so much for joining us uh, here on Capitol Hill and online. Uh, for this very important briefing, and I want to thank our panel. Please help me thank our wonderful panel. Today.